that kind of use of the data is almost borders on propaganda. You know, yeah. it's, it's like it's 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 not it, it's just like you are you don't even need the data. You already have decided what's true. And so the, the data isn't even like important. The, the scientific methods, I think, are not a list of results. They're a list of, you know, they're a list of methods. They're a list of like, uh, you know, that this is what it means for it to be true. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Today, we have Scott Cunningham from Baylor University to discuss many things causal. Scott, welcome to the show. Thanks, Glenn. So, um... You wrote a book. It is called The Causal Inference, The Mixtape. And yeah. um, that that is going to be essentially the basis of our conversation today. It has a really cool cover to it, which is a great start. Um, and um, so my last mixtape, it had, and it was an actual tape, had Pat Benatar, it had Eddie Money, and it had Flock of Seagulls. Um, <laughs> how did you choose what went into your mixtape? Uh so I chose things based on uh, the most widely used methods for applied people. So for, you know, it, it's it's the the, the mixtape that I have is basically a collection of, I guess, four or five different um, research designs, or that's what I call them, research designs that aren't quite estimators, but they're more like a class of approaches or strategies that are taken. So I sort of picked them, you know, basically that if you're an applied microeconomist, then you'll typically, these are the one, like if you live now, those, these are typically the things like everybody just kind of knows that they'll go to more than like an estimator. They'll go to difference and differences or they'll go to regression discontinuity design. And so I picked the, the most common things done in empirical micro. And then, um, and then I had like two chapters that were what I thought to be the the kind of the, the conceptual framework for the whole book, which was the counterfactual theory of causality, both in the embedded in the potential outcomes notation, as well as the um, so that's like one chapter is potential outcomes, and then another is on these causal graphs. So I I by you to Pearl. And then I had like a probability chapter to try to to kind of lay out uh, a, sort of some basic ideas about probability. So I, I I chose stuff that I thought was the things that everybody in my everybody in the in the in sort of applied micro, and then what I also saw that influence or also saw in political science and sociology um, uh, that was just the stuff everybody did all the time but that was not in the textbooks mm -hmm. interesting so uh just as a quick a bit of accounting uh so to say um i also noticed that the textbook did have a very microeconomics yeah bent to it which you know obviously i'm totally happy with i thought that was fun um but these methods that you're covering are essentially things that are presumably they're in the literature, but they're not in student textbooks. And they're essentially within the sort of research lexicon and toolbox of uh, not just microecon, but uh, sociology and other social sciences. That's right. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Sweet. So it's sort of like, uh, like a shepherd for these little lost sheep where, you know, they're out there making wool and you got them into one place where um, students can look at this book Yep. And it's a, yep. Okay. Yeah, because when I when I when this was my personal experience, I I econometrics, so I have a PhD in economics and econometrics was my field, but I'm not an econometrician and and would never uh call myself one. And so um we never learned any of this material. So this was like I graduated in 07. Uh the, the my interpretation of the growth of of design based causal inference is that it it never really moved through the economy it never really got into the econometrics textbooks and you know I, I don't exactly know to what degree that's true but it, that's definitely the feeling I get if you read like you know Green's uh, book on econometrics or even Jeff Woldridge's book on econometrics he he now has in his new panel econometrics book. 
a chapter that's on program evaluation, but like it, it was really just it, this way of thinking and this way of teaching econometrics was just much rarer. And the really only other example of it before my book was mostly harmless econometrics. And, you know, I don't know why I, that book I always felt like was more advanced or uh, then there were things that I wanted. There were, there were ways that I thought that I could get that material across in a different way or emphasize different things or, or just simply uh, um, even just having more code. That was the other thing about the book. I just felt like the, the, that, more and more the the typical student was not a, a statistician or an econometrician they were just ordinary ordinary people uh working with data that needed more more training on you know programming and just kind of like cracking things open um in different ways and so i i um felt like the um the work that was out there was really good but i felt like i there were things i was kind of wanting to do that was a little bit different Mm -hmm. yeah the coding issue is interesting because you know essentially when you're trying to teach people new things the art of teaching um you have to give them theory and these abstractions but the fact is when it comes down to actually well then how do you do it you don't want them to be having that sort of like supervisor you know, was it the sphere of knowledge where the moment you walk away from your supervisor, you immediately don't know what to do anymore. Um, right. So code is concrete. That's, yeah. that's the most beautiful thing about it. So effectively, there's no point at which someone's being introduced to a theory or a concept or idea without having a concrete piece of code that they can go through and yeah. actually learn, which yeah. I think is fundamental. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree. I, I, I also think that, I also think people learn in different ways, you know, People learn, uh, you know, from the from the point of the the algebra into the the code, and and then, but I but I actually think a lot of people think in terms of spreadsheets. I think they think in terms of code. I think they see data in their brain, and then if they can see the calculations mechanically walk through the crank of code, they can go back and better understand the 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 articles you know and so so my my feeling has always been that there's this missing student who uh just needs to see this in different ways and and walking them through concrete syntax can be and might be for a lot of people sometimes the way they learn a method you know and and then they learn the method they see concretely it's these specific averages you know, and these transformations of these averages, and then they kind of go through, do it by hand, and then they go, oh, now I see that's what these symbols mean, or that's what this going on in this line of code, and and I just feel like I, you know, code is really, really important both for doing it, but sometimes even for understanding the method. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, you, you won't get any disagreement from this corner. I actually think that probably the preponderance of students are actually more likely to learn things by coding yeah. um, than they are uh, analytically. So I think computational-based learning is much more tractable for people than yeah. uh, analytical learning. And right. uh, funny enough, the immediate previous uh, interview to this that a few days ago, the exact same thing was said. And then uh, Mina uh, Chetangaya Rungel, uh, Rundel from Duke University, who does a lot okay. of open access stuff, she has... Uh, I ran it by her because she knows way more about teaching students than I do. Yeah. And it just, it seems like there's a large number of people out there who actually are discussing the idea that this computational approach to teaching must be, might be way better for a large portion of students. Um, yeah. yeah. And I would actually very quickly pause it without going too far off track that there might be also positive selection or essentially this focus on analytical learning. So essentially learning the analytical approaches, uh, has been, it's very good for like, if you're going to be selected into academics um, right. and become a professor yeah. in that, that's your only mode to show that you understand things have good grades is effectively we've been positively selecting people who only under, who are excel at this one type of learning into academia. And now they are the next generation of professors when yeah. the majority of students actually learn by this other way, i.e. computational learning. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
But, That's what I mean by like, you know, when you think about how the world is so different in 2022 than like 20 years ago and that just the sheer number of people that are expected to work with data, you know, like and when I say work with the data, I mean, like pretty, pretty, pretty large amounts of it. You know, the, the share of the workforce is, seems like is there's just a much larger group of people that are expected to know how to handle data. And I don't mean just like in a simple way of just taking averages, they're, they're writing code, they're running regressions, they're plotting data, they're, they're doing all kinds of things. And that, if that's becoming the modal, if, if the modal, you know, data worker is no longer a professor, then probably the optimal way of, of instruction probably should change a little bit just to be more aligned with how they kind of naturally think, because they're not really like, sort of, you know, you're not seeing the kinds of people taking the needing causal inference or needing econometrics or some a particular st stats course to be the people that were going into academia, even if they get a doctorate. Yeah. Yeah. That, so that is the reason that I think they need to see the code, but not at the expense of understanding what it's doing. You know, that's what I try to do in the book is, is both of it, you know, help explain precisely what it's doing, how to do it, and then stick to, you know, the, the clear exposition of what I hope is the correct exposition of the identification procedures. Um, just uh, to clear up a bit of terminology, you've uh, used terms like design uh, and yeah. program and estimators. Yes. Um, can you clarify what those mean to people? I mean, obviously, we are a statistical audience, but yeah. just to be absolutely sure uh, that we know what you're talking about. Well, so for... Uh, so for design, um, that's a phrase that I've, I guess that I describe design. So the way that I think about causal inference is probably pretty particular to me, uh, or maybe it's not, I'm not sure. The, the guys that won the Nobel Prize in October, Hito Embens and Angris, Josh Angris and David Card, they're closely connected with the the Princeton University's um, industrial relations section in the 1980s. And, um, and so their, their approach to uh, their approach to the, the like labor economics problems like minimum wage or immigration or, you know, returns to education. It was like, they, what they did was they relied a lot less on um, they relied a lot less on the, the, like the theoretical models, the, the behavioral models, as opposed to some of their contemporaries did, it seemed like, and they, they began to kind of approach things a little more a theoretical with these, uh, adopting something called the potential outcomes model. And so that was that potential outcomes model is the counterfactual notation that Don Rubin sort of popularized. And so the, the, the thing that I think about in my mind is that design is just a way of describing estimating causal effects where causal effects are expressed in terms of that model free kind of notation of, you know, outcomes in a world were treated, outcomes in a world were not treated, you know, comparisons of those are causal effects. So I kind of already think of causal inference as kind of like, design when it's more formally connected to that that kind of way of doing work that you think of with Princeton and others, Ruben and others. But then the within that tradition, within that tradition is is essentially like what I then see is like two separate approaches. One is anything that depends on randomization. You can see that like in those procedures, instrumental variables, matching, randomized control trials, they'll have in there, you know, a particular statement about how the treatments are assigned to units independently of potential outcomes. And I think of that as like true, almost kind of like true design. So it's like, you know, it, it's, it's going to be, and I use those terms because it, it just seems like that's what his, this group continually uses that phrase. And the best I can tell is, is design is, is, uh, you know, you know, depending on that, usually it's going to be randomization, some sort of randomization assumption to get those causal effects. But then there's like, 
even within that Princeton tradition that uses that potential outcomes model, there'll be this other, there'll be this other uh, approach that's taken that's more like restrictions that'll be placed on the potential outcomes that'll allow for a particular procedure to, to quote work. And that'll be something like uh, the parallel trends assumption, indifference and differences, or uh, the smoothness assumption or continuity of the potential outcome function in, in regression discontinuity model or factor model for synthetic control. And that'll be like, it's, you know, you're able to identify. So I guess in some ways, you know, probably if the, that sort of modeling approach where you're saying we're going to be able to identify the causal effect using this particular procedure, because the underlying potential outcomes they're missing will, will do these kinds of things that we're watching this other thing do. And that kind of modeling approach is, uh, doesn't use randomization. And so the the way I kind of think about design is kind of like in that sort of framework of randomization of treatments, non-randomized treatments, but be willing to place what you consider to be believable restrictions on the counterfactuals. And then, um, and then estimates are, you know, essentially uh, efforts made to to get to obtain coefficients that are to obtain, you know, numbers that are approximately correct or their approximations of those unknown true causal effects. And, you know, so, uh, so, you know, so then you said design estimators, uh, estimators and programs. Estimators. Yeah. So in programs, is that just said programs? Yes. yes. Yeah. So I guess programs I just would consider to be, you know, literally the recipes that you feed into R, Stata, SAS, you know, any of the Julia, any of the programming languages just to, to, to take the data, go through the calculations in order to do exactly, you know, what you believe will be, you know, in expectation correct uh, for the unknown parameter that you're trying to identify. Cool. Yeah, no, that's helpful. So if you don't mind, I'll probably botch this a little bit, but just to try to recap, uh, when yeah. we're talking, when you say designs, it's some constellation of uh, methods, the yeah. data and assumptions. So essentially the assumptions that are necessary to make your ultimate estimator yeah. an actual representation. So essentially it's like the more or less you do methodologically, the more or less you'll need to have certain assumptions as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. right. Cool. Yeah, sweet. Yeah, it's yeah. like they're like so. Yeah, design. I just think of as like, I see design, uh, design. I I think in terms of, of one, key, you know, designs are things where it's like, if you can make this one statement about a counterfactual, right? Then, or you have this one belief about a system, then here's a set of techniques that will identify the the one parameter that you care about. And so if you're willing to say that the system fits that 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 instrumental variables sort of setup, well then here's about two dozen different procedures that'll attempt to get that parameter you care about. And, he, and if you believe if you're willing to say that the unobserved uh, counterfactual trend in potential outcomes for the treatment group changed exactly the same as the comparison group then well here's that's called difference in differences and here's about another two dozen things that you do to tackle it and so i always kind of think of designs as like one key one key belief um that you can take to the data that you're willing to sort of you know really hold on to that one and try to provide evidence for it but if that one belief is true you know you're able to kind of you're, you have open up to you a bunch of different estimators, you know, specific transformations of the data that you could do that would get that would get at the answer, the question you're trying to answer. Yeah, this, it's actually uh, super close to what uh, my is I intended to be one of my final questions, which was, you know, like, uh, what, how nihilistic could I be while still accepting causal inference? So it's essentially like, which things could I fundamentally not believe um, and still accept it or alternatively, if I don't believe X, when are certain aspects of causal inference ruled out? Um, maybe it'd be profitable to leave that till the end once we've talked yeah. about more of these things to uh, yeah. flesh it out a bit. Um, you had a really cool example. Um, what I'd like to talk a little bit 
it's actually uh, pretty close to this, um, is on, you know, the issue of behavior and causality. So you have this really cool example about, I guess, behavior, causality, and correlation. Um, right. And you had this example of a person in a boat in a storm. Um, and this is a very good example of why the correlation and causation mismatch and there's a human element to it. Right, right. Yeah, I... I... I feel oh. like I got. The, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Can you can you uh, recap the analogy and then yeah. and then we'll go from there? Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like I got this analogy from you to Pearl, but I cannot for the life of me find anywhere he said it. So I don't know if I came up with it or if he did, but it feels like something that somebody else would have came up with. But but so I had this idea. I had this idea of um, of an example to illustrate that just because two things aren't correlated doesn't mean that one thing doesn't cause the other. Um, and, uh, at least like observationally uncorrelated. And so I had this idea of this woman that's like, uh, piloting a sailboat across a, a really windy lake. And, um, with this caveat, I've never been on a sailboat, so I actually don't know how to fly pilot one. So I, I, I don't think this is exactly accurate, but like, you know, she's, 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 uh, piloting her sailboat across the lake. It's, it's really windy. And, you know, sometimes when the wind blows, uh, she moves the rudder in you know towards it and sometimes the wind blows in the other direction and she moves it away she moves it in the other direction and i kind of thought well imagine if she imagine if like every time she moved the rudder she like offset the wind exactly you know and and then if you had a data set like showing the number of times that she moved the rudder every minute while she piloted her boat across the lake and you knew like the direction of like the latitude longitude or some sort of like coordinates of where she was going you'd see you know you'd have this this variable that was like changing all the time the whole time she's she's piloting her boat it's just constantly changing and her direction is never changing and so you would observe that and you would say well her rudder's broken you know because she's moving the rudder and it's not moving the boat Right. And and so but that's not but like so if you kind of like think about that and then you imagine, well, what if she was. What if she was flipping coins, heads, she turns it in one direction, tails, she turns it in another direction. It's, you know, I, I I think you could do that right on that same day and get a uh, a variable listing all of her changes it might have the same mean it might have the same standard deviation like the, the they look like in their distributions they might be really similar those two variables and one of them have a call one of them one of the correlations uh, uh, uh you know one of the correlations measuring a causal effect on direction and the other one just you know being un uninterpretable in terms of its in in, in a causal sense and so um, the, the thing about the thing that, that I like about the potential outcomes, the thing that I like about potential outcomes is when you write down what is, what is needed, you know, to identify if you write down, if you, if you, if you took the average of an outcome for a treated group and an average of an outcome for a comparison group, I do this in the book, you can decompose that average into the average treatment effect, what's called selection bias, and then what then what's called heterogeneous treatment effect bias, and and you can see right there that you know the 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 you don't have to have uh, observationally there be any correlation for it to be causal because if those selection bias and heterogeneous treatment effect bias you know are exactly offset that average treatment effect, you won't see anything. Now, whether that happens all the time in the real world is a different question, but, but like there are things in economics anyway, that we think actually are like that, you know, the, the federal reserve, if there is a, an emerging recession, the central bank will engage in what's called open market operations and they'll buy bonds in, uh, uh, when they buy the bonds, they'll dump money into the, into the economy. And if they were to do it right, and, you know, like I hypothetically, theoretically, anyway, when they do it right, they buy and sell bonds all the time and it stops recessions before they happen. 
So you would be like, if you regressed, you know, if you look for any correlation between GDP and the buying and selling of bonds, you'd find no relationship. When in fact, like the reason is, is because they're not behaving randomly. They're, they're behaving in such a, they're, they're behaving in a way that is what's called endogenous. And so it, it's, uh, you know, endogenous behavior uh, will, will violate the very key assumption of independence that allows you to interpret simple, simple comparisons is, is causal. And so, you know, that's, that's what I, that, that's what I was trying to get across in that mm-hmm. analogy. Yeah. Uh, it actually, you had this quote on um, that in observational data, correlations are almost certainly not reflecting a causal relationship because the variables were endogenously chosen by people who were making decisions they thought were best. Um, yeah. And then I think one of your section headers is optimization makes everything endogenous. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we, uh, so your previous examples work well. I had one question about optimization. Um, what about when people are not acting optimally? So is optimization yeah. just the, the search for optimization? Yeah. Or it's like, is it just will? Well, it's, it's, yeah, that's a really good. That's a really good point. I mean, people uh, act op- suboptimally all the time. So it's, yeah. Right. Right. Well, it, it, it doesn't, it does. I don't think that, it requires uh, that they, you know, maximize uh, their utility. What what I mean by optimization is that they're solving a problem. You know, is that all, all it really takes? All it takes in order to cause, uh, you know, a violation of the of the assumptions necessary for simple comparisons to be causal is just that they base their choices either on uh you, you know how badly they're doing in a world without the treatment which is selection bias or they're selecting the treatment uh because they think it's going to help them it's like all, all you, you know you don't need a whole lot in order to you don't need like you don't need perfection you know you just need like people if people do stuff because they think it's going to help them we're already in trouble Right, that's all that's all that's all it kind of needs so um uh and you sort of see this i mean you know compare compare people uh, an alien comes from another planet and looks at earth during the covid epidemic sees people sick with covid in the hospital measures their mortality sees people outside of the hospital with covid measures their mortality concludes the hospitals are killing people right and so, well, it's not that, you know, it's not that the hospitals have to be like the most efficient uh, entities, you know, it's just that because they're selecting into the treatment based on the potential outcomes, it necessarily means that the correlations don't mean you, you can't just take them naively as in causal effects. Cool. Yeah, that is, that is an interesting thing. Um, one other quote that you had that I thought uh, would be uh, very interesting to talk about is uh, the following. Uh, you say that um, credible and valuable research requires that we believe that it is more important to do our work correctly than to try and achieve a certain outcome, e.g. confirmation bias, statistical significance, asterisks. Um, and you say the foundations of scientific knowledge are scientific methodologies. Very good point. Um, true scientists do not collect evidence in order to prove what they want to be true or what others want to believe. They are process-oriented, not outcome-oriented. Without these values, causal methodologies are also not believable. And the reason I find this super interesting is um, because, you know, as I'm a data scientist, I'm in industry, and um, I view that we essentially, we're hired for a twofold purpose. One is to actually discover things. So essentially figure out what is the connection for our the our employers, you know, essentially find actual information, figure out how to use it, exploit it, and things like that. Um, yeah. So it is very much purposeful towards and oriented towards an outcome. Right. Um, and that doesn't align with what was just said here. However, the second thing that we do is aligned, which is that once we've come up with something, a solution, a proposed solution, then we need to put on our science hat and sort of dispassionately say, is what we just found true? Um, right. And that is the bit that aligns with that quote. Um, so essentially, there, there are two 
goals, but they're in tension with each other where we actively need to find something. We can't just be like uh, saying, oh, we're just going to tell you what's out there. We yeah. actively need to find something. And at the same time, we're intentional, just needing to be dispassionate about what we're trying to find. Yeah. Wait, so so what's intention? What, what would what's intention with what I said? Can you give me like a concrete example? Oh, or- uh, the uh, what would be intention is, uh, for example, with myself, uh, patient biosign monitoring, where yeah. it, the question isn't just saying, uh, can uh, do vital signs or can vital signs have you know um, predictive value and what the patient's outcome would be? It's actually more like use these vital signs to figure out what the patient's outcome is going to be so that we can uh-huh. inter- interfere with it. And so effectively we're given a task. It's not just saying like dispassionately assess one hypothesis. It's actually saying like discover the hypotheses that we can actually use the data. Um, you know, d- discover these true hypo- the, the hypotheses that are of use to us scientifically. Um, so that, that, that bit's the, the tension. And then the bit that's not intention that aligns well is saying, well, after you've come up with a hypothesis, well, after you've come up with a model that you've had to discover, right? then is what you discovered actually true? And that's the bit where then you have to be dispassionate and say, oh, well, here's the actual effect. Um, right, right. So it's, it's an interesting thing. I, I, don't, I don't think that there's, it's not, it's not a contradiction. It's just a tension between yeah, yeah, yeah. these two things. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking of it more like, you know, in the, I, I was thinking of it more like, with this, with these kinds of causal questions, you know, you, you might, you might want things to be true. You might, you might want, you might want it to be that, uh, some thing that you did, um, some, something you, you did in your community, some policy that was chosen in your community or your firm, you might really want to hope that it's the reason why the firm is doing well. Right. And, uh, and so you can imagine that there's one kind of, uh, you know, situation where a person just, just collects data in order to tell that story. And, and I was just trying to say that the, the thing is like, that's just, that kind of use of the data is almost borders on propaganda, you know, like it's, it's, it's not. It's just like you are. You don't even need the data. You already decided what's true, and so the the data isn't even like important. The what I was kind of trying to say was the what we need is a when you when you have a scientific methodology. You know, like what I try to lay out in the book for each of these designs is like a way to a way to interpret correlations as causal. You know, what's nice about them is, first of all, they can answer the question. But if you commit yourself to them, this is, I think, sometimes the hard part. You know, if you if you commit yourself to them and say, you know, I'm going to I'm going to, you know, be willing to listen to these types of answers and form beliefs that are that are based on these kinds of things. You can you can change your mind. You know, you can uh, you know, you can you know how to train yourself to change your mind. And so, um, and you can, and it can be hard, you know, some, some, some findings I think are difficult. So some, sometimes you find things in empirical work and it's like, it's a difficult result. You know, a program that your positive was helping is, is not helping or, or maybe even hurting and, and, you know, these kinds of things are, you know, or, or it's like a, a, a result in a literature, you know, that is like a giant, you know, some, some key seminal work. that has got maybe like five, 10,000 sites and you've been working on it. Uh, you know, what would it, what would it take for you to believe that it's, that some of these results are wrong, you know? And so the, the scientific methods I think are not a list of results. They're a list of, you know, there are a list of methods. There are a list of like, uh, you know, that this is what it means for it to be true. Yeah. That, that, I yeah. I like that a lot. It's actually a, uh, again, a theme that comes up a lot in these uh, conversations where people continue to reiterate that uh, science is not a body of static right. knowledge that it's actually 
a method by which to iterate through yeah our body of knowledge um yeah 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 that, that sounds like that I, I agree with that yeah yeah uh and i keep i keep bringing up it's like you know and it was like we aren't crazy in saying this i uh uh carl sagan literally says it about every third paragraph in every single book that he ever wrote so you know um <laughs> you know yeah and and and, and in, a, in a rich like deep sexy voice too so it just sounds great as well um yeah um you actually on that note you have something else where you said i believe it's that um empirical results are the cornerstone are a cornerstone of or sorry empirical results are one of the cornerstones yeah. of science i hope i'm getting that right unfortunately i didn't write it down um, yeah. yeah okay uh what are the other cornerstones um because I, I both agree with that statement that there it is one of them. Right. Uh, but right. what are the other ones? Uh so probably uh the 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 creative work of cogent theory is mm -hmm. probably a part of core is part of it. You know, I mean, uh a lot of the a lot of theoretical work is you know, may not even be born out of may it might not even born out be born out of an empirical result, you know. And so so uh uh I think like Gary Becker's work in economics or Al Roth's work. I mean, they'll be very closely working with, with empirical people, but their work kind of comes from first principles, you know? And so probably the, what we would just kind of ca call, uh, you know, the, the theory itself is, is uh, a big part. Uh, I also kind of think a big part of um, the cornerstones of science is, is measurement and um, uh, just you know counting things correctly is it's an underappreciated uh, uh, an underappreciated part of science just getting the numbers right. I think that's also a part of it. Um, those are the two that I, I think are and, and just description, which I guess is there's measurement and then there's just pure description, you know, of the world as it actually is. Um, I think those are also, you know, a major part of science, of just uh, of the cornerstones of science. So I'm saying causal effects is just is just one of them. It, lo it logically connects all of them together because the theories, you know, well, for instance, like theories usually make testable predictions. Testable, testable predictions are usually causal. Um, and so, you know, but you, but those have to do with data. Which depends on you know getting good observations that are collected well and stored well and all those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like a quick example to tie those together between the necessity of cogent theory uh, measurement and the actual, I guess, empiricism or empirical results would be something like uh, just very quickly like Pythagorean theorem. You know, it, it's never going to be empirically disproved um, yes. because it's theoretical, and you could actually have someone go through and draw a bunch of right triangles and measure right. them. And the fact is they aren't going to equal one because there's the measurement issue where you can never right. be precise enough uh, right. Two because you can't hand draw a perfect triangle. Um, right. But the reason that cogent theory is necessary is because effectively we need that to be the bedrock to make sure that we don't do something that's empirically silly. Um, right. Even though you could actually wave it and be like, the data says, right, right. and you'd be correct. And you'd also be totally wrong. Um, right. 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 But yeah. Um, actually on that, um, what are sort of are there different aspects? Are there different meanings for causality? Like, yeah, do people mean different things? Some people for Granger causality, but what are the different right. meanings of causality? Right. Uh, I think that there is like in the. I think people largely do agree with a counterfactual theory. I don't know if they. I, I think they agree with a counterfactual theory because when they say when they say what they mean by causality, they're almost always talking about it the way we formalized it. You Which know? is what? Sorry, just like what is the counterfactual theory and how has it been formalized? Well, so like the the counterfactual theory, I guess if this is the right way, you know, I mean, if if you go back to people like John Stuart Mill, he'll have like several conditions for what makes something causal yeah it'd be, it'd be like a lot of things but, he, but he's what he's trying to do i think is trying to give you the well it's philosophical so i mean i, I think like he you will usually 
be describing the counterfactual, which is like, uh, I went to college and I am happy today by some amount. I feel like I could be measure, I could measure that happiness. Had I not gone to college, if my happiness was different now, then the difference between those two is the is was caused by is is because of college. Mm -hmm. so like the I think people largely I think they largely believe of causality. They think of it as if I do this and this happened, they know that if they say I did this and this next thing happened and I therefore believe the first thing caused the second thing. I think in their mind they know that if the first thing was followed by the second thing and had I not done the first thing and the second thing wouldn't have happened then then the then the choice caused it. I think yeah. they they may not necessarily like they may find it awkward to walk it out. You know, to like walk it out like that. But I think they do think that. Now, whether or not they make mistake, the, the problem is, I think, without training in statistics and like any kind of formalized framework for just the like a keeping track of these ideas, which is what potential outcomes to me really does well, you just make mistakes. I mean, it's, it's it, I'd be curious what you think, but it, it doesn't seem like, it seems like we we learn causal effects in our personal lives, if we get to do those activities over and over and over again, you know, so it's like, I know that every time I turn the doorknob that the, that I can open the door because, and I know it's because I turned the door. Knob. I know, I know it's not coincidental that every time I turn the doorknob and I'm able to open it, it just happened to be the one time the latch wasn't working. You know, I know it's because I turned it. Why? Because I have turned doorknobs about 10 million times. Yeah. You know? But something like, uh, um, uh, like a, a, uh, uh, well, going to college, for example, going to college, right? Yeah, I went yeah. one time, right? Yeah. Like I went one time. Uh, do I know that the reason that I feel the way I feel is because I went to college or not? You know, or or like, you know, you could have events that happened in your life that you just, uh, you know, you, you think that the reason you have certain kinds of relationships is because you're of the of the way you and your dad were. Right. It's like, you know, well, it's like you only did one trial. Yeah. With your dad. So you have you have no idea. You could be right and, it, and you could be wrong. Like it's like it's completely impossible for you to know in your personal life. So like things that you can't like repeatedly do just seem to be things that we don't like iterate towards the causal conclusion being pretty right you know like probably pretty right um and so the things that you never get to do is it seems like those are the things that you sort of do need a more formalized way of providing an estimate and you still might not know in your own life you still might not know in your own life i mean i will never know in my own life what the effect of me going to college was like you might be able to know in a population, estimate some causal effect of going to college on happiness for some group of people who were shifted into college because of something, whatever. But, you know, whatever some you group of like third graders who got randomly randomized yeah. into college, like we didn't exactly. like this one yeah. bit. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Right. You might be able to identify it for them. Right. Under And, and even then you got to contend with all kinds of measurement stuff. But like, um, but you, whatever you find, then you'll still never know with yourself. You know? Like, why am I the way that I am? Um, and that's, but I think that, so I kind of feel like people do know. I don't think what people know is how to interpret causality, though. I, I think that they make more mistakes than they, I think they make, I think, a, I think the average person makes a lot of mistakes on things that they do not have a lot of personal interaction with very often and, and haven't. And uh, yeah, you know, so without that, like without the ability to do it over and over, I think you're probably even more likely to make those mistakes. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess maybe like the human brain's pretty darn good at learning causality yeah. for certain things, but the right. things that we're good at learning about, 
we take for granted. So effectively, like the causal machine that's good at figuring out like the fact that a small child has a not bad understanding of basic practical physics. Um, right. Like they know if you push that cup off the table, they know it's going to spill. That's why they're right. doing it. Um, right, right, right. Yeah. Um, and so I, I think it's one of those things where they're very, the human brain is very good at picking up certain, a vast number of causal things. Um, yeah. And we then just take those for granted. It's like, okay, what's the next level up? And it's like, well, then it's all the tough stuff. And that's what we focus right. on. Yeah. Right, right, Actually, right. I have this really good quote from a book on causal inference that says, uh, the core uncertainty within a causal study is not based on sampling uncertainty, but rather on the fact that we do not know the counterfactual. <laughs> um, yeah. You, have you, are you familiar with that book? Yeah, I'm familiar with that book. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, I, I, I met the author. He's a nice guy. Um, so like, so taking that to another level, um, yeah. getting around to like the nihilism question, um, basically, are there are there certain things where if you say, like, if we don't know the counterfactual, at what point does this counterfactual not being sufficiently represented in the data mean that our causal inference can no longer be useful anymore? Uh, so, yeah. for example, connecting things across time uh, is a very difficult thing. Or um, a simple example is there will be no counterfactual in any of my work to studying a hospital that never uh, that did not have access to germ theory of medicine. Right. You right, know, is, right. is there, there, there's no counterfactual to that. So I can't do a counterfactual on that. I have to just deal with other potential counterfactuals. So where's that breakdown? Um, or actually, let's say applied. What are common ways that this breaks down? Um, is it over time? Is it along sociological phenomena, which are extremely difficult to create counterfactuals for? Um, mm. wh where's sort of the mess? I mean, um, so I think that... So one of the limitations of the potential outcomes model, I don't know if limitation is the right word. I don't know if Don Rubin would say it's limitation. It's like a feature or if it's a bug, but like the, the thing is you're, you're, you're only estimating these treatment effects. Um, uh, like there's this thing called the Sutva assumption, the stable unit treatment value assumption, which prohibits, it like it like pro, it like defines the causal effect in a way that like almost even makes it even less in some ways like less realistic. So like you can't in this causal effect like have spillovers between other people. Your choice has no effect on my treatment effect. And so uh, so why does that matter? Because like sometimes what ends up happening is you'll estimate treatment effects in a model, all right? And maybe you'll use like the fact that 50 different states, you know, a bunch of different states adopted laws and you sort of like use that, use some sort of modeling of how that rolled out. But you you still only are able to estimate effects like within a given system that's like already in place. So, you know, trying to figure out like, like I, like I, defund the police right that that is so far outside anything that we do that i don't think any anything that we could get estimates of would tell us anything about what that would be like right you know? so like i have a study where um where we use there was this uh n this uh event that happened in rhode island where um uh in 1980 they had their legislators had had changed uh, key language of the laws defining what sex work was, uh, prostitution. That's like been a large part of part of my research agenda. And then they they basically deleted uh, parts of the law that that actually prohibited prostitution. And so from 1980 to 2003, they had legalized prostitution, and nobody seemed to know about it until a judge. Uh, so they were still arresting people charging them with a law that did not actually exist. Uh, and so uh, in 2003, a judge recognized it and said, police had to stop arresting. And the impact that it had, you know, we like go through and we look at the effect that it had on violence against women and STDs and like we laid it out, but, you know, there had never been any policy like that. And so, you know, 
in you like these kinds of things where your the limit of your knowledge is based on little bitty marginal changes of a given agreed upon system may not tell you anything about a completely different system you know and i and i feel like that's one of the things that i feel like people you know i, I feel like we I feel like this is one of these things where it's really challenging is, is that, you know, the external validity concepts, I think everybody kind of knows external validity concepts, but like sometimes the external validity concept is like, there's like extreme uncertainty. You, you, you really have no idea what a certain policy would be. You know, there's no, there's no, you know, these first mover policies, no, there's no telling what to expect. We might not, you know, we, we, we may not, be able we may have a lot less guidance to go on on that kind of thing to find these counterfactuals for stuff that has never been tried before you know so i mean i i and then i mean uh, all of these procedures you know all of these procedures uh uh in rhode island um the the finding the counterfactual for Rhode Island using synthetic control was challenging because uh, of one outcome, the set of states that had experienced similar kinds of events leading up to that particular decision were a much smaller number. And so finding it like a, a reasonably weighted uh, counterfactual for Rhode Island was, you know, was was uh, challenging and I could have imagined a world in which Rhode Island just had been too much of a, an outlier that even with that natural experiment I might not have been able to find a, a credible estimate of a counterfactual you know post treatment because Rhode Island just doesn't seem to be like anybody else you know um and so you know because always what you're doing in call to inference is you're just trying to find someone that approximates the what would have happened and you have all these procedures that are laden with assumptions that you're going to use to do that and it's possible that even with all those procedures you still just can't you just don't feel like it's very satisfying for a lot of scientists part of for example our skepticism around the conclusions on social science and sociological phenomena is that basically we believe that empirically the vast majority of interesting like counterexamples and counterfactuals truly never do exist. Um, right. And that effectively that limits the ability to say anything strongly. Um, and so I guess what are, um, this is interesting because it's basically then I think, but there's a subjective element where it's like, at what point are you still saying something useful or alternatively, at what point can you construct between your data uh, your methods, and you put those things together, where you still are providing plausible counterfactuals, uh, for example, right. like observational health data, where you have so much data, it's like, on one hand, you say, well, you know, we have so much, maybe we plausibly can construct these counterfactuals. Maybe yeah. we can plausibly construct this missing data. Um, right, right. And then, and, you know, another domain expert might be like, you know what, even if you did construct these, and we have these synthetic counterexamples, they still aren't believable. Um, right. So right. for example, the, you're probably not going to get a, well, here, here's an example. You're probably not going to get a super wealthy white suburbanite uh, who has a health example in, you know, rural North Carolina. You know, right. you're, you're, you're not going to get that person. <clears throat> they, they don't exist. And there's no construction that you can do to pull data yeah. together to provide those counterfactuals. <clears throat> and there's so many things like that where effectively you can have these worlds that are literally, they're separated not just by one dimension, but by yeah. so many dimensions. And I, I, I think that's a, that's the case a lot. I find myself believing this a whole bot, a whole bunch in healthcare and in clinical scenarios where effectively, <clears throat> um, uh, when we we're talking about Eric Daza, um, who does the N of one, uh, a lot of N of one or stats of one work. And, um, the idea is that effectively people think that one patient is only separated from another patient by maybe one parameter or like oh. one or two of these parameters. Like they're, oh, their heart rate's just different or their blood pressure or something's different. But really it's like, no, uh, 
a small number of differences in the clinical setting, given the way that doctors interact with them, how they're yeah. triaged and things like that, they are many dimensions away from it. And so right. from that, like I find myself being very skeptical that we would actually be able to construct these things, even if we put our best effort into it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. I mean, I, I, oh man, I mean, I don't know if I'm being dishonest or something. I mean, I am deeply skeptical of, you know, causal knowledge, very skeptical. It's guaranteed, you have to be, you have to be skeptical because the causal effects, if you're, if you frame it in the terms of counterfactuals, then it's literally impossible to know a causal effect because you do not know what would have happened had this other thing done. Right. So you, you, you always are, you have this like profound epistemological uncertainty. That's just like always there. So I, I always feel it. Um, but I know that the work of humans is to try to understand the world, the, their environment. You know, I, I, I've paid attention enough to, in my classes to know that, you know, we're trying to modify our environment to maximize uh, the overall well-being of all of the, all of these people, these 10 billion people on the planet, you know, as much as we can, some weighted average over all of them or something. And so, um, uh, so we use the best tools that we have at our disposal to learn as much about, you know, what happens when you do one thing over another. And I do think like, I do think that some techniques are are so much more they 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 calm the causal anxiety down so much more than others you know like so so um uh i remember being at this talk and i think ruben said this at the talk but i'm gonna i'm gonna interview and i'm gonna ask him if this is something he says or if i just imagine this i can't remember anymore but i think he said you know something to the effect of we know with an RCT that the if the treatment is assigned independently of the potential outcomes, then we can write down these conditional expectations equal to each other. And that means, you know, and there is the 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 selection bias is zero. So we know that the the average watt, the average potential outcomes are equal for the treatment and control group. And he said, because we know how the science works, meaning like, you know, we know how we know how probability theory works. So we know that's true. And I, and, and I was like, and I've, you know, you can run through simulations, you can do it yourself. You can see that like, you know, the, in large populations, in large samples that the, the mean potential outcomes into being equally distributed, they have the same distribution across the two groups. And that gives us permission to then believe that, that this source of this selection bias is gone, even though I can't observe it being gone, you know? And I find like, I find that the, Anytime there is randomization, physical randomization, I just feel a lot better, you know, about the um, the results being causal. I still kind of look for lots of pieces of evidence that can kind of that can kind of go along with it. But you know, when there is a true RCT, the 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 confidence I feel, even though I still can't observe the counterfactual for the treatment group, I know that uh, the comparison group. Uh, is the counterfactual, you know, in the large sample. It's when you move away from the randomization methods that the sheer, like, body of evidence that you have to produce to to give yourself just any leeway to think, and this is probably causal, is, it's a big, you know, it's a lot. It's a lot to overtake. And, and um, I, uh, uh, I guess I, I just have feel a lot more comfortable living in a world. Well, first of all, I I don't have to actually make any decisions in my real life that kind of depend on speculative causal effects very often. Mm -hmm. You know, before the college one, other than the college one, other than the college one, and even then it was you know it was more (laughs) like that. I just knew that you just went to college, you know, graduated high school, but like um, the. I, I I bet just you know running being governor or legislator or president or running of a large agency or 
you know, having to make these decisions when you really just, you really fundamentally don't know what effect it's going to have. I mean, it just must be, you know, people's lives are at stake on it. It's just really stressful. You know, it's just really uh, hard uh, to, to have to make, the, to make those. So I, I don't know if that e- exactly if that's the kind of answer you're looking for, but I, I get, I d- am just, you know, deeply skeptical person that we can really know what caused something else, at least at the individual level. Yeah. You know, at the aggregate level, I know how to read a paper, you know, and I know how to interpret things, but, you know, in individual lives, I, I'm, I'm very skeptical. There's a Chinese proverb, you know, there's this proverb of uh, um, this like man and his, and his son, and they have a, a horse and they like have, they like depend on the horse for all their livelihood. And sometimes bad things will happen or sometimes things will happen to the horse. And then there is like an impact on their livelihood one way or the other. And every time something happens, people in the people in the in the community will say to the the father, oh, we're really sorry about what happened to you, you know, and uh, like maybe maybe the horse got hurt or, you know, maybe it lost in the fair or maybe it wins. They'll always say, you know, we're really sorry or we're really happy for you. And he'll he, every time he always says, maybe it's good. Maybe it's bad. I don't know. And. And no matter what, the whole the whole proverb is that, the, like from start to finish, the whole proverb is maybe it's good, maybe it's bad. I don't know. And I I think like some you know I I think there's like a, that I I've come to believe like you know there's just so little I'm able to really conclusively say in my own life or others' lives as to you know what this meant you know, what the impact of this one thing was. Maybe it will be the worst thing that's ever happened to me. And maybe, uh, you know, maybe going to college uh, caused me to lose out on millions and millions of dollars as of something else I would have done. And maybe, uh, you know, having made this other decision, if I hadn't have made that, if I hadn't, you know, I made this one decision and, and what followed was something horrible. Maybe if I hadn't have made that decision, I'd be dead now. You know, and so, you know, the, these things are like, they're all unanswerable and it can be really, I don't know, the potential outcomes model has, has left me so kind of skeptical. And now I just kind of see it as, you know, in the task of doing the work around us, this is the best tools that we have um, for making reasoned beliefs about, you know, cause and effect. Yeah. I think what was really helpful is when you said um, that effectively it helps. It's our best way of calming the water. So regardless of whether or not we believe it, it's not a binary on yes or no, this is truly causal, this has truly been answered versus like, this is our new best way that we can adjust for our belief system. Just very much in the same way that you might say, you know, we'll adjust for bias when estimating variance or we... Yeah, actually, it's exactly that. We'll just adjust for bias while estimating variance. Yeah, um, yeah. And these are the most plausible ways by which we can adjust for those. And the name for that is causal because we are essentially becoming more cognizant of the assumptions that we have. Yeah, yeah. And the manipulations that we need. Yeah, yeah. Um, right. Yeah, that's great. Uh, cool. I, I totally agree with that. Cool. Yeah. On the upshot, um, because I'm always interested, uh, I'd be interested to hear your thought on this. Um, do you have a favorite example of a causal inference predicting something, um, you know, correctly, when the more naive or observational approach would have gotten it wrong. So, is there, has there been, any, are there any good examples where causal inference has had this sort of like inferential ace in the hole or something like that, where they've really knocked out the park? Um, well, not counting, like, um, yeah, okay. Well, this is not one of my favorite, but this is something I've been. So this guy, Gary Becker, uh, he won the Nobel Prize in economics in 92. He, he's, he was one of the people that really inspired me to, to become an economist. He studied crime. He studied a lot of stuff and uh, built just theoretical models, not, not empirical stuff. I, I doubt he ever ran a regression in his whole life, probably. And so um, uh, he had this like, you know, every one of his models, it was like took basic economics 
and like applied it to something that, you know, was not thought to be in the purview of economics, racial discrimination, education, crime, the family, marriage, fertility, all this stuff. And in his work on crime, it's a lot of stuff, you know, it's like the model is deep and it gets into a lot of details, but like one of the things that it's most known for is this prediction prediction of deterrence and like, um, and in the prediction of deterrence, deterrence basically says, if you make a crime more expensive to commit, someone will commit, won't commit it. That doesn't mean everybody, you know, it doesn't mean it's a counterfactual question though. It's like, you know, here, here's, here's the punishment. If you commit this crime, now I'm going to increase the punishment. Would you have still committed the crime? Yeah. So you raise the, the you raise the price fuller on exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You ra- you increase the minimum wage or the min- yeah. Right. It's like like so maybe the pro- maybe the punishment is a fine, you know, or uh, maybe the punishment is um, more prison time, right? And so it's but the so it's really hard. The problem is like it makes these clear predictions and. It's almost unambiguous. Like it's not even like a qualified like if all this stuff. It's pretty much like it will happen. How big it'll be is empirical, but it will happen. And so, well, the problem is, uh, you know, states and uh, judges—they're not flipping coins, deciding on sentences. You know, they're giving sentences to people who have committed those crimes. And so, like, they're—you know—you you, you can't compare someone who who got 10 years uh, to someone that got nothing. You've got all these like, you know, problems of selection bias in it. And, and you can't even like easily like look at increased punishment over time because, you know, states are oftentimes increasing prison sentences because of crime, you know, because of crime that's happening. So there was this like, so no, for a long time, nobody really even knew. Nobody even knew if there was deterrence effects. Uh, that there was like, or, or at least like not convincingly there and there, but there has been some. And so like, there was this one really interesting study uh, done in Italy by uh, a team of Italian economists. And uh, in Italy, there was a, uh, like every decade or so they would, they have some institutional feature and they would like pardon a ton of people. And I can't remember exactly why, but they would like, they would, they would pardon all these people. And they, they did this pardon and in this one particular kind of pardon. So they pardoned them. It's like me, me and you get pardoned. Okay. And, uh, but if we, if we commit another crime, we'll get punished. Okay. For that crime. And we have to fill re, you know, we have to fulfill our old sentence. Okay. So like, let's say that you uh, got pardoned and you had one month left on your sentence and, and I got pardoned and I had one year left on my sentence. Right. Well, if you and I commit the same crime, we will uh, effectively get the punishment for that new offense. And I'll get, I can't remember who is it that had more time left. But you, like, you would, so you, you would effectively, you're looking at a higher punishment. I'm looking at a higher punishment for, for what is effectively crime. identical crime. Yeah. You know? And so they tried to, they basically got the data on, now, you know, it's all, it's, it's causal inference typical causal inference it's like it's going to be this very specific population that they're studying and it's like you know so it's only deterrence for uh former convicts that have been pardoned and it's like all this stuff but they find evidence that you know that the for the people that have additional sentence there's like this that uh, that residual sentence has this deterrence effect on crime it's just it's not very big so that was like this really interesting. was like this really interesting study uh, of of um, that uh, there there was deterrence effects, just like Becker said there would be, and they were not very big. Like the size of them, that the, for every additional month on a sentence, you did you had a negative effect, but it it like it didn't have at nearly as big of enough effect for us to base our entire crime policy around it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, yeah, that's that's a really interesting example, especially because what I'd be interested in to see for that is one, you have essentially a few treatments. You have the people who do not have a prior crime. So effectively, they have the uh, penalty plus zero. 
And right. then for the remainder, you have a penalty plus, uh, you know, P sub I, where I is essentially the extra time that will be added to, you know, yeah. basically some people have a year, some people have a month. Um, and so that's interesting. And I'd also be interested to know what it would be in relationship to the severity of the crime. So effectively, yeah. if you have a month, you know, you're not going to steal that. If you, if you have a few years, you're not going to want to risk stealing bubble gum, you know. Yeah. Right. I don't know, people exactly. who end up, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, whereas yeah. like, if you're going to murder someone, you know, what's an extra year? Um, right, right. And right. so that would be interesting, the scaling of that. Right, right, um, right, 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 right. Yeah, you might expect, uh, yeah, because all you all they're really getting is like uh, this, this like going from a positive number to a slightly more positive number. Yeah. And, but this is where it's kind of like, you you start to realize doing these kinds of projects, you're like, okay, now I got a particular estimate of a deterrence effect in this particular weird Italian context. And, you know, you, you realize like, well, that estimate is really, really important. It looks like they found evidence for deterrence effects. I don't think that probably is the final, you know, word on it. I don't think that we should be done but trying to, you know, but you can see how it was like, it was really hard. It was really hard to figure out if even that was true. And we're not going to randomly assign people to prison. Yeah. You know? uh, so it's like th these kinds of things um, uh, are really, really important. And, and, you know, sometimes those causal effects are just masked in the data. Uh, and it requires a lot of creativity to pull it out or yeah. luck even. Yeah. And then I guess, especially because if you then had a separate set of empirical measurements on whether or not people are deterred at all. So effectively, you yeah. just have to look at the like within head calculation. Do exactly. people even give a crap? Um, and then if you find that out, it's like, well, then how do you how do you parse those two pieces of information? Uh, right. Does one just completely negate the other? Right. Or um, it's interesting. Um, we only have a few minutes left. And yeah. um, so I did want I did want to ask. Uh, see got five minutes left i will try to cram in three questions if you don't mind okay all right <clears throat> very I'll do the best. yeah uh one is you had a probability and regressions review yeah. in your text was there anything in there that you thought that was sort of useful so you know a lot of people traditional stats students sort of pick things up and that there's actually some basic probability or review things uh, that I think so I mean I I think I I put that chapter I you know when the, when I when it comes time when it comes time to write the revision I I I won't be probably including that in there maybe maybe people that aren't familiar with the Frischwald level theorem might like looking at that regression anatomy section uh, that might be interesting I think to learn a little bit about that but otherwise it's all really really basic Bayes rule is in there so if you yeah. have no Bayes rule that's uh you know uh, you being a Bayesian you, you know it's like the coolest thing uh I think is is you know is uh learning why Bayes rule is such a is true um I think I think that's cool well as but a practicing I, Bayesian I actually only know the top half of Bayes rule so <laughs> you know, <the> top. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but cool, yeah, because I mean, you had things like clustering in there, which I thought were yeah. interesting. So, like clustering effects. Uh, what, yeah. what, like, do you have like in a sense or two what those things are? Where basically you have um, some phenomena do not uh, affect observations individually, but they do affect groups of observations that involve individuals, and how they affect those individuals within a group in a common way. Well, the only thing is the the reason to learn. I mean, it, it you know the the only reason I did it there was because clustering is an issue that come that that is that panel data and repeat across sections can run into with for the difference in differences material and the one econometrics work on difference in differences before this like recent wave of work was just on clustering so you know i think like learning that without adjusting you know learning about violations of those iid sampling assumptions i think that that it it, you know, seeing how that affects, uh, you know, the standard errors that you calculate in an OLS model. I think that probably would be fun. I, the only thing about the, that might be neat to someone in that chapter on clustering is the simulations, you know, to kind of see the, the over rejection issues kind of visualized. I thought that was kind of neat. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that is cool. I'm in a, as always, I'm actually a big fan of rereading sort of introductory and uh well, I wouldn't call it, call it introductory, but essentially like the basics of things. Cause yeah. each time that somebody presents it, they usually present it from a slightly different way. Yeah. Um, and I did find that interesting because there was a real although you were presenting what's common knowledge coming from it from that causal slant. Yeah. Um I, I, I really felt like there was that strong like grain, that oh. strong flow in there. So I thought personally, I thought I thought it was interesting. Um, huh. that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So our penultimate question is um, yeah. what is one topic that you would like the scientific community to debate? Mm. Uh, a topic I would like them to debate. Um Well, I, I guess it would probably be, um, hmm, what am I interested in these days? I'm so obsessed with causal inference, I've gotten out of my literature. I mean, a lot of the work I do right now, I, I think trying to figure out um, what, so a lot of my new research focuses on suicide attempts in jails. It's the leading cause of death in jails, the suicides. I think I would like to see more debate about um uh, what programs can be practically implemented in jails and prisons uh, to actually have um, an effect on the suicides? Um, I think that that that's not. I don't think in corrections there's um, a ton of policy experimentation. You know, around. For, for good reason, you know, pro probably seemingly for good reason, but like at the same time, I don't know if we have like a ton of knowledge of what programs jails and prisons can employ that actually can impact suicides. I would like to see more policy debate around that. Cool. And uh, final question. What is one topic you'd like to see the statistics community debate? Yeah. Um, Well, I would be curious to see more interaction within statistics with this Uniperl directed acyclic graph stuff. You know, in econ, it's been largely ignored pretty much for the most part. Um, and uh, um, in epidemiology, it's very popular. I would love to see more interaction with it within, within statistics. Um, uh, I think that would be, I think that would be um, interesting uh, to see to what degree the stats believes that is, you know, that kind of graphical causal modeling is, is useful. And then to see like, you know, if there's things that since so much of the DAGs is within the computer science community, you know, to have more people from statistics be able to interact with it, I think that would be uh, useful to build on it if there is things to build on it. Especially like, you know, within even, and, and I would love to see, it's like, if you look at my book and I don't think that I'm, there's like a big omission, I, there is far less interaction of that potential outcomes community of like Embens and Angris and others and the, the Bayesian community. And I would love to see, you know, I don't understand, uh, I don't know, like it, in my world, there's so little conversation between the the applied community, this causal inference kind of work, and then the Bayesian community. And I, and I what I would love is, I would love to see more interaction back and forth between that. I don't know, you know, I mean, I know obviously causal inference within Bayesian econometrics is, is big, but for some reason, the, the bridges between it and my world seems very fewer. I don't know if it's missing like right they're underdeveloped. Well, like it's they're... like, I don't even think it's the, I don't even think it's the ideas. I think it's just, there's some reason something is keeping conversation. Something is keeping people from reading each other, you know? And I don't know. Uh, I don't really know what that is. Um, uh, like I, like I, I would love to know more of like Bayesian people working on minimum wage projects or 
or crime projects within that potential outcomes paradigm to better appreciate what the Bayesians would uh, help us with or help with that for some reason I have these huge blind spots on that I don't see. I would love that. It's great. Um, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, and, you know, if you don't mind, because you've also done some uh, very interesting work, for example, as you've mentioned on prostitution uh, yeah. from an economics perspective, and it'd be really great to have you on again yeah. um, at some time in the future, just to like burrow down into an actual applied topic and sort of the state of the field and how that theory and the quantitative elements and the domain all interact. That'd be a fantastic conversation to have. Oh, great. I would love that. Great. Cool. Well, uh, Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks. For, this is uh, Scott Cunningham, and he made a mixtape on causal inference. <laughs>